Um, I wanted to thank Jason very much for inviting me and Berlin here, uh, despite on uh, last minute, because uh, we just got this invite last week. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, great to see all of you guys. Um, what I will be talking to you guys about today. Um, so, so what my, for those of you who don't know me, what my research agenda is in general is I'm an economist who looks at genetic data. So I try to think about how does genetic data fit into economic analysis. But also I try to think about how does um, econometric methodology, how can we sort of uh, incorporate that to make genetic data, uh, our analysis of that better. And this paper is very much a example of that second idea where um, I look at the type of GWAS summary statistics that people uh, usually estimate. Um, and I try to think about the idea that these data sets are typically selected in which we estimate these types of GWAS uh, summary statistics. And I try to use a weighting procedure to correct. So that's simply the, uh, what we're doing here. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can always shoot me a message on Twitter, uh, through email, if you have any questions on this paper, or just in general about what my ideas are about genetics in econ. Uh, and I work on this paper also with several co-authors, Titus Galema, who's my uh, supervisor, uh, and Ben Domingue, Jessica Pau, and Andres Moraes. Um, so the idea that we're starting out with here is um, this idea that many GWAS data sets that we have exhibit what we could call a healthy volunteer bias. So that's the idea that if you sample people from a certain population and you ask them, do you want to share your genetic data with us? Do you want to, you know, can we ask you many questions? Can we measure your height? Can you take some time out of your day to, to come to us? The people that then show up are typically different from the population that you sample. Namely, they are healthier, um, but they are also of higher socioeconomic status. They tend to be older. They tend to be more likely to be female, higher educated. All of those things you could summarize in healthy volunteer bias. Um, there is some uh, evidence already that this type of selection bias could lead to false positive associations between genetic variants and phenotypes. So one example of a paper that shows sort of a red flag to the literature it is a paper by Pinastu et al, where they tested um, in two highly uh, selected data sets, namely 23andMe and the UKB. And they checked whether sex was heritable on the autosome. Well, we know biologically speaking, the autosome could not code for sex difference in, in people. And nonetheless, they show that in both these data sets, uh, sex has significant autosomal heritability. And they attribute this to selection bias. Um, there's another paper that shows that genes in the, themselves are directly associated with study engagement. So you can do a GWAS on study participation. For example, in the UK Biobank, you have these optional models that people can opt into. Well, you can do a GWAS on that phenotype, right? Do people participate in the optional model, yes or no? And again, you find significant heritability, some significant SNPs, etc. However, that's that doesn't really give us much to work with to go to the core question as to like the, the GWAS summary statistics that we typically use. Think about the GWAS for educational attainment. Think about the GWAS for height. To what extent are these GWAS results biased by these type of selection biases? So that's really the, the core question of this paper. And then the next question to ask is, of course, if we then do post GWAS analysis on potentially biased summary statistics, to what extent can those be biased as well? Um, I also want to say that, that what I'll be focusing on in this paper exclusively is, is the UK Biobank. Um, but I do think that the conclusions of this paper holds more general because volunteer-based sampling is very much, it's almost synonymous with genetic data, right? We cannot force people to share their genome. So usually we have to ask for voluntary permission. Um, so if you think about other planned biobanks, such as all of us, our future health. Uh, in the Netherlands, I work a lot with Lifelines data. This is all volunteer-based designs, right? So, so the, the types of things I'm going to talk about, I very much believe that those types of concerns should also uh, uh, be in the back of your mind if, if you ever plan to work with any of these data sets, which I'm sure some of these people are planning to do. By the way, any questions, uh, any discussion points, I'm, I'm happy to take them during my presentation. So, you know. The contributions of my paper quickly summarize. So what I do is I study volunteer bias in the UK Biobank. Um, what I, the strategy that I take is um, what we always do in economics to, to correct for volunteer bias. So 
I have created weights for the UK Biobank, and the goal of these weights is to make them representative of the underlying sampling population of the UK Biobank. Uh, well, what we can then simply do is we can estimate uh, a weighted GWAS, which is a GWAS robust for volunteer bias. Uh, I do this for 10 phenotypes, it's sort of a mixed batch, medical, behavioral. Um, what I found then is correcting for volunteer bias decreases your effective sample size by a large extent, at least 61%. Um, but that's something you have to take into account is that the UKB doesn't give you as much information as you might think it does. Um, I also show, and this is sort of a, a positive finding, is that typically, uh, I mean, not for all the 100 million associations that I test, but typically uh, a SNP association will become stronger, so further away from the null after you correct for volunteer bias. Uh, and that results even in finding new low side. Namely, three new lows are for type 1 diabetes and one for breast cancer. These, if you look at the GWAS results for all these four lows, they're completely attenuated. They're complete null. It's not like they're just borderline significant. And then, uh, but the, so it's really very much hidden by the, the selection bias. Uh, as a result, a example of a post GWAS analysis, heritability estimates become larger. Um, I also find, uh, oh yeah, and I also find uh, different bio annotations. So um, yeah. I don't do all the post GWAS analysis framework because that would keep me up like all night, but uh, just just showing a couple of things to, to show that you can get different results. And the, the message of this paper is really that, that anybody who works in this type of space should think about selection robust uh, statistics for the GWAS. And then we will hopefully see the literature move towards, you know, see which types of uh, post GWAS analysis are, are impacted on the whole. So <laughs> I don't feel like doing everything, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, in general, so I really think this, this highlights the importance for us to think about this stuff. And uh, um, we have to work on getting these weights available and all, the all these types of data sets, I think. Maybe work on also doing better statistical strategies to deal with this problem. And uh, as a contribution there, practically, I also make these weights available to UKB users. Um, so to introduce the topic a little bit more, um, I have a paper that I put on Bad Archive uh, at the beginning of last year, which does not have any genetic data, but it just simply tells you like what is the problem of uh, selection in the UK Biobank and how how can we create sampling weights for it. So that's really the paper where I create these sampling weights, and I think everybody working with the UKB should read it. I think in general everybody working with volunteer based data should read it. Um, but the most concrete output is that it creates these sampling rates. Just to share a couple of conclusions for the paper. So any type of association statistic uh, that we estimate in this paper in the UK Biobank, so think about simple association between going to university and uh, your sex, for example, anything like that exhibits significant volunteer bias. How do we know that? We compare it to the UK census, and it's always quite different. Um, so then we... Our goal is to create these weights. Well, these weights are inversely proportional to the probability of UKB participation. Uh, um, the way that these weights are estimated is again by estimating a model that uh, estimates the participation probability into the UKB by comparing it to UK census data. We do a lot of work to take a particular subsample from UK census data that was eligible to be sampled into the UKB. So given the right age range, but also given the right regions of residence. Um, and these weights are fairly good at capturing the volunteer bias, because in all the association statistics that I estimate in this paper, after applying the weights, the volunteer bias that I described first reduces by 87%. Um, let me first show you an example of that, actually, and then I'll talk maybe a little bit more about how we precisely estimate those weights in the paper. And then we'll talk about this thing, yeah? Um, so just to show uh, one of the results of the paper, which is a bit key, is here we have a very simple association, namely the probability of reporting poor health and whether you are born before 1950. Well, if you would do that in the UK census, only the subsample of the UK census that was eligible to be uh, sampled into the UK Biobank, you'd, you'd get what you expect, namely, positive association, because older people are more likely to report being in poor health. This seems perfectly sensible, right? If you do this association in the UKB, it's even negative. So you get a completely wrong conclusion and you sort of 
as a researcher, you'd be saying like, the older we get, the healthier we get, right? Which just doesn't make any sense. Um, now, the weights that I've then created, uh, if you do the weighted association in the UK Biobank, it again becomes positive and much closer to the UK census estimate. These are confidence intervals. So as you see, the confidence intervals don't overlap, but you do get much closer. Uh, I'll talk a little bit with how, about how we actually estimated those weights. So again, like I say, we stack UK census, UKB data, and then the underlying vehicle there is a very simple model, a logit type or a probit type of specification, uh, where we take a lot of variables that the UK Biobank and the UK census have in common, and um, uh, that all relates to, that all capture that healthy volunteer bias. So these variables are um, birth cohort, sex, education, the region of residence, self-reported health, and then some socioeconomic variables, a single household indicator, and also ethnicity. We do a very flexible model there. So uh, we incorporate all two-way interactions between these variables. All these variables are in some way categorical. So we make a dummy for each level that the variable can take, all the interactions that you can think about. So in the end, you have almost 5,000 regressors. Uh, it's a bit large, so we do use a lasso selection procedure there as well. Although, to be fair, the data is so large that that would probably not even be necessary because we're talking about uh, like 500,000 UKB observations here and about a million UK census observations that we have. So, uh, so just to clarify, in the end, the matrix C just includes those. Those were uh, variables that the lasso selected. From uh, yes, or, or exactly like the the lasso is going to set a lot of the deltas to zero. That's what the lasso does. Right, right, and so, but that was the the variables that ended up being most important. Yeah, exactly. So Z is all these these four thousand variables and all, all the interactions. Options, those were most important. Yeah, yeah. So what? Ha why not just control for those in the model? Ah, this is a, so so, so in, instead of a weighting procedure, saying you have a linear specification and you. Uh, control for these. So that's another thing that the paper uh, talks about, um, not extensively, I should say. But the thing is, controlling for variables associated with selection is not at all guaranteed to get rid of the selection bias problem. And very often, these variables act as colliders, mm -hmm. in which case they might actually make things worse. So what I actually do is, um, in, in this paper, right, um, I have various models like this, mm -hmm. where I compare like the, the UKB association, mm -hmm. and this is sort of the truth. Uh, I show that this gets closer using my strategy. I actually have in the appendix exactly the same strategy, but adding controls to the model. It doesn't solve anything. It, it, volunteer bias is basically, I think it even made it a little bit worse, but like so you increase the volunteer bias by 5% rather than, um, so it's just not the right way of modeling. Okay. That, that last exercise you mean is that what you just showed us was 4,000 variables that lasso selects some some subset of mm -hmm. that exercise that didn't work was just adding them as main effect. Yeah, well, not the interactions, I should admit, so, so just the, um, the 10 variables, say. Okay, that's what you're comparing. Yeah, like yeah. 10 variables. Right, I mean, this is, this is an, so, so if, like, so you could call this a, a linear control function approach. So I think you have two issues here. It's one is which variables are you going to include? Right. Uh, and second of all, is that that it's really, yeah, control variables is really, it's always really difficult to think about do they make things better or do they make things worse because they could act as colliders. Uh, so, and there is there's fairly sizable literature on this as well. It says just, these weights are much more robust to collider bias than, uh, than control variables because here I really don't so much care about the, the direction or the causality of things. I just want to, this is really a prediction problem, right? It's to predict somebody's propensity from a whole bunch of indicators. And I really don't care much what comes first even, or, or whether education, whether it's really education or something tagging education or like a personality type, right? I just want to predict as good as possible. Um, so yeah, it, it just, it's in that sense a much better approach. Uh, let's see how we do on time. It also helps. So now we go to, so that those, that those are how, how I created the weights and, and some motivation why weighting is necessary. Um, I want to show a little bit of theory is going to help us to later put the results in perspective. So think about what we typically do in GWAS, where we typically do a linear equation, right? Uh, the SNP leads to Y and there's a B, B time involved. Uh, 
I'll do a very simple simulation with a sort of a SNP with a minor allele frequency of 0 0.4. Um, and and the, I say the true model is that the SNP is an effect of 0 0.04. And there's two scenarios regarding selection that you can think of, right? The problem is we are not estimating this equation in the full population. We're estimating this equation in the, the selected population. Think about two scenarios. One is phenotype-based selection. So only people with a large Y select into your sample, right? You do a you do a educational table GWAS on predominantly high educated people, which is what the GKB is more or less. Scenario two is a little bit more involved where we have independent selection based on two channels. One is the phenotype and one is also the SNP. And here you can have a 2A, 2B, either they go in the same direction, so positively based on the SNP, positively based on the phenotype, or it could be negatively. So positively based on the phenotype, negatively based on the SNP. But it's just a simple simulation where I'm going to show um, under what scenarios we get close or far away from this true estimate 0.04. That should be the next, yeah, the next slide has trouble loading. Yeah, here we go. The so first scenario one. First of all, in the population, it's all fine, right? We get this estimate. Uh, this is the phenotype-based selection. Well, here you get attenuation bias. So you get bias towards the null, yeah? Um, in this case, you get a very close to zero effect size. This, this is the parameter, sort of a 5% participation rate, which is more or less what the UKB is. Then the other two scenarios, it's gonna love. This is slow. Yeah, there we go. Um, the other two scenarios are, are much more worrisome. Here, you know the direction. It's always going towards the null, right? But in this case, you get a really a strong collider bias, so it could even turn negative. It's a negative bias that could potentially be so strong as to flip the sign of your estimate. This is what we saw for that. I think what we saw for that example I just gave with health and aging in the UK, by the way. Or the other way around, we get a positive selection bias, and, and it much uh, we have a much larger effect size than we typically estimate. Now, of course, if we think about our true beta being zero, then in this scenario we don't have much trouble. But in this scenario, uh, we could kind of find anything, even though the SNP doesn't have a true effect. Yeah, um, that's just yeah. I call this phenotype-based selection. I call this phenotype-genotype-based selection. Um, now let's go towards the data. So what we are going to do is in the data, in the Yucca Biobank, we have the weights, so we can do two things. We can do regular GWAS, no weights, and we can do weighted GWAS with the weights, and that's gonna solve all our problems. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I guess we all kind of know what the UKB looks like. So when I talk about the UKB eligible population, you have to think in mind this. They invited 9.2 million participants, uh, but these are not everybody in the UK. They are in a certain age range and they have to live close to an assessment center. Now, these assessment centers are in large urban cities, London, Bristol, Manchester. Right? So we're looking at a little bit of a more urbanized population already. Um, but uh, you can compare then this. So what we do in the, in the we, we have a census 5% subsample to estimate these weights. We take out that subsample that we call UKP eligible. So it has the right age range and uh, lives in these regions that were sampled, yeah? Um, that's 9.2 million participants. In a sense, we observe a random 5% sample of that, but that's, it's, it's representative, so that's fine. And of course, the true participation rate is 5.5%, 500,000 people, more or less. And yeah, there's a uh, the large literature to show that there's the healthy bond zero bias really in the UK Biobank. If you compare some statistics on these people, versus those people, they're older, they're likely female, higher educated, et cetera. A little bit more that we have to do today that to get towards a GWAS sample there is of course, exclude non-European ancestry individuals, uh, exclude some people with low quality genetic data, drop some first degree relatives. Those are typical things. We're trying to get at the sort of the, the GWAS sample in the UKB that people use the most because this is where we want to investigate selection bias for this particular part of the literature. Uh, and one extra thing is there were about 6,000 people that had so much missing data that I thought we couldn't estimate weights for them. 
but that's about like one one and a half percent of the sample. That's uh, that's just a little extra drop that we do. But I think that the, the sample we end up with is sufficiently representative of uh, what people use in the literature. So the final end is about 377,000 people. And this is the phenotypes that we will look at. And I say it's a bit of a mixed batch, and don't ask me why we selected these and not others, but uh, the BMI and heights and anthropomorphic, and then some more medical stuff, uh, diabetes, breast cancer, health rating, some health behaviors, physical activity, drinks per week, and yeah, some what you call more sociological variables, age at first birth, only in feet. Emails. And uh, I think educational attainments are, of course, uh, what, what the sociologists or economists are by far most interested in, I think. Um, okay, what, what will we do methods wise? Like I say, this is the regression. Um, of course, usually we control for a limited amount of variables in GWAS. Uh, and I people always say control, but actually they don't do that. They just residualize their phenotype from their controls. Uh, I did that, but for the way the G was, I controlled for them in a weighted least squares regression using again the same. Uh, and then the controls are fairly standard genetic sex, 20 PCs, virtue fixed effects, and gene batch fixed effects. To make the problem a little more tractable, uh, I only do a million SNPs that were also in AppMap 3. So not all the SNPs in the UK, by the way. Uh, again, the standard controls on the SNPs that leaves us with about a, a million SNPs to consider. Uh, and then the, the, the exercise is fairly simple. We want to estimate beta either through OLS or WLS weighted least squares, and that's then the way that she was. Um, where we, of course, use this inverse probability weight. One thing we do both for the GWAS and the weighted GWAS, which is not standard in the literature, is hyperscatastasis robust standard errors. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you weight your data, you more or less automatically um, introduce heteroscedasticity in your analysis. So that's why uh, we want to make those sandwich estimators. And of course, then I also do that in GWAS um, for comparability reasons, which I found out didn't make too much of a difference. So for GWAS people, we are fine in a sense. Well, how are we going to compare the results, right? So we get all these, these SNPs, weighted effect sizes, unweighted effect sizes. So I do a couple of analysis to, to show that selection bias matters. First, I want to know top hits that we know for the traits previously estimated in the literature. To what extent are they robust to this type of volunteer bias? So I take uh, hits with a sufficiently small p-value. Um, I make sure that, that those are estimated by sort of a large GWAS that did not include the UKB because I don't want to pay for any sort of GWAS or weighted GWAS approach there. Uh, but of course, these other data sets might have similar selection problems. Uh, and I check, um, uh, and then that analysis I can do for seven out of 10 phenotypes. Then we can do sort of a simple regression for those top SNPs of the unweighted on the weighted effect sizes. Um, we can also, uh, this I do for all the SNPs, uh, test for significant differences between GWAS and weighted GWAS effect sizes using a simple Hausman test, where then we have a p-value. So now in a way we have three p-values. Is it significant in the GWAS? Is it significant in the way that G was? And are the effect sizes of these two SNPs significant? Yeah. So here I again maintain a uh, uh, p-value of five times 10 to the minus eight, the, the genome-wide significant threshold to say like, do we find genome-wide significant evidence for uh, selection biased SNP effects? Uh, we can do a genetic correlation between G was and weighted G was, where if it's smaller than one, it indicates that there's uh, some problem there. Um, we can also estimate the effective sample size for weighted GWAS, and that's how we can uh, comp capture the loss in power that, that we have to take into account when, uh, when working with selected data sets. So the way I think about this problem is you have a selected data set, so you kind of have to admit that you need to use these type of weights in order to do robust analysis. You're going to lose power as a result. So how large is your data still? So it's a useful statistic, I think, to think about how useful is highly selected data, that's it. Um, then we do some post GWAS results, uh, starting with heritability estimates. Well, the, the, the vehicle in the literature, there is LD score regression 
one thing we have to then change there of this core regression takes the sample size as your parameter. So for the way the GWAS, you want to take the effective sample size. And um, yeah, there's a significant test you can do for whether those GWAS and weighted GWAS are uh, significantly different, those heritabilities, all those factors in the denominator just come out of the LD score regression information that you get. One other thing that I do, these slides are not complete because I kind of mix things up and it was last minute, but uh, <laughs> we also show some bio annotations. This is fairly simple. I just put the way the GWAS and the GWAS in the FUMA pipeline and I got some different graphs. So <laughs> you can see that the, it leads to different conclusions. Yeah. First, I wanted to know, does this, do I actually have some reason to believe that this whole weighting of GWAS works, right? So one thing to think about is, is I captured weights on, I estimated weights on a lot of phenotypic data, educational attainment, uh, employment status, whatever. Does it actually capture some genetic variation, right? Because if the weights don't capture any genetic variation, it seems like they wouldn't be very strong in, in a GWAS analysis to begin with. Well, how do we test that? We can, of course, do a, a GWAS on the weights themselves, right? And there we got seven genome-wide significant hits um, and a SNP-based heritability of 3.6%. But it captures, it captures definitely some variation going on in the genome. Can, of course, do genetic correlations as well. But they're, they're inversely proportional to selection the weights. So if it is true that those with high educational attainment are more likely to participate, then it means that those with a high weight have low educational attainment. Uh, if you look at the genetic correlations, indeed, low genetic correlation with educational attainment, also aged at first birth. Um, these are uh, the participation GWASs that I talked about. So indeed, people who are scoring high on scientific participation have lower weights. Uh, some other stuff as well, height is significant, which I found fairly surprising. And then on the other side, um, we see things that are very consistent with healthy volunteer bias, namely people with uh, larger weights, they are more likely to have large BMI, higher on depression, and also more likely to smoke. So just in general, this, this is all in line with healthy volunteer bias, say. Okay? Um, let's look at the results then of comparing the GWAS and the weighted GWAS. So first we look at these top hits and we find that the top hits are more predictive after weighting. So I selected the top hits for each trait from the literature. Uh, I can do a simple regression of the weighted effect sizes on the unweighted effect size. Well, if the slope is equal to one, then you found the same thing. But what I found for most traits is that the slope is significantly larger than one, as you can see here. So. Mm -hmm. For educational attainment, uh, for these top hits, a 10.9% increase in the effect size. So 10.9% lift off. Um, similar for the other traits, breast cancer is different. Breast cancer, we find that once you weight it, the effect size has become smaller, at least for the top hits. But later I'll show that if we look at the whole genome, effect sizes for breast cancer increase, and we even find a new significant loss of locus. Um, then are there any questions on the top hits? Or th then we go to like the, the full genome, um, where we can first make some simple summary statistics. So we can do the genetic correlation between GWAS and weighted GWAS. Um, again, if that is significantly smaller than one, then uh, there is some discongruence between those two. For most, actually, for most traits, we're doing fairly okay if you look across the whole genome. Because even if they are significantly different, I say they're fairly high. Um, but there's definitely a couple of traits that stand out. Type 1 diabetes, again, breast cancer, uh, also physical activity. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say, of course, how large, how close should this statistic be to one in order to say, like, I don't care about it anymore. I think that's a difficult decision to make. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we, find, we find that it matters more for some traits. And, and, and not so much for other traits. Are you surprised that uh, the impacts seem to be greater for these health outcomes? That's definitely surprising. Um, and that's something I've thought about a lot. One reason is not surprising, I think, is if you think about healthy volunteer bias, is health is really a strong indicator of whether people go to these data centers or not, I think. Uh, it also has to do with mobility and um, 
So maybe there's there that's that's an underlying reason that for like uh, I mean one one there's not many health related indicators in the weights. One is self reported health. Uh, but that might capture a lot of the volunteer bias in itself. That's that's a possibility, I think. You have seen that when you create the weights, you do not have these health progressors. So therefore, maybe the the result here is something. Yeah, then that's a surprising indeed, because I, I I'd expected because I didn't have many health indicators that it wouldn't be able to capture that so much, but apparently it does. Uh, and, but you do have celebrated health, you have any other like, things like that proxy for health, such as educational payment, socioeconomic status, uh, region, and all these things are correlated. So, yeah, it is kind of surprising, but it's what we find. Yeah. And I would like to wonder how do you perform the weighting to us for binary traits like uh, breast cancer and stuff like that? That's a good question. That could actually also maybe be why we find some differences here. It's, it's, simply, it's simply a linear uh, uh, model. And, you know, question on binary alpha. Yeah, so a linear probability model. And then maybe then the weighting also makes more of a difference because uh, there could be different marginal effect sizes going on uh, different uh, places. So, But on the other hand, severe obesity is a zero one, is that right? That's right about diabetes. Yeah, so severe, and then for BMI, we don't find much. So we'd expect for severe obesity also to not find much. And, but from just pure binary points, yeah, that doesn't show up on obesity, but it does on diabetes and breast cancer are binary. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the exactly, and but it could be that 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 the if you also think about power, maybe the, the linear probability models, there's not so much information in them, so maybe that's why the weighting also makes more of the says they're being a little bit more unstable or something. Uh, I still think you know if that's the if that's the, the test that we're doing and the data, then we should still apply weights to them because I just think that's the, the appropriate way to think about it. Uh, and yeah, you can uh, next thing is then of course look at the effective sample sizes where you see that kind of trade specific, uh, but usually you have more than a fifty percent power loss. Now, uh, how could we test if we have some new hits? First thing is to look at Manhattan plots. Usually, if you look at these Manhattan plots, you don't see much of a difference, visually at least. But for type 1 diabetes, we saw sort of the strongest differences between GWAS and weighted GWAS. So it's good to show, to sort of see what's going on. So for type 1 diabetes, you see the GWAS, basically what the genetic architecture looks like. We know that there's a lot going on uh, on this large haplotype block that people have at chromosome six. I forgot the name. Um, and um, not so much, and then you pick up some related signal also uh, on some other areas. And so what you see if you did the way that she was, that, that strong signal, it replicates. Uh, so that's, probably very causal and doesn't matter too much if you're maybe a high educated individual, low educated individual. And, but the other things kind of become insignificant, but in return, because you'd expect them to become insignificant, right? You have power loss here, but in return, you get signal back that you did not see pop up uh, as much without waiting. But there's kind of two things going on. So those two things, the power loss is straightforward. Everything yeah. should get worse as far, as far as detecting. Yeah. But when you find something new, is the idea that the selection was so overpowering that the power loss doesn't compensate for it? This is... That's exactly the idea. It's the idea, but how... It seems... It seems like a lot of selection uh, because you, you show the power loss is 50% or something, mm -hmm. right? So it's something that the traditional GWAS that had much higher power couldn't find as a selection undid like what's going wrong with yours? But I'm not saying that the power loss is 50%. I'm saying that the loss in sample size is 50%. Right? So then, uh, the power loss is definitely not as large. Um, but yeah, that is sort of the idea. I think that the um, you could find new strong evidence for, for certain signals that you could not previously find without waiting. But if that's a mechanism, should, should you expect to see a similar increase in effect size on Compton 6? After the weighted up, well, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying that the um, there's no reason to believe that for every single SNP your selection pressure 
So the selection bias for each single SNP is the same and in the same direction for a given phenotype. But so here you're saying the selection is not upon diabetes itself, because if it is, this is the strongest uh, signal for that. that. It could be that the selection is type 1 diabetes itself, but it could also be a related trait to type 1 diabetes, or it could even be a combination of those mm -hmm. for each SNP in the genome. Right, yeah. so uh, in a way, every GWAS, when we do a GWAS regression on each SNP, we do the same model. But what could go on, the appropriate model at each SNP could be completely different, right? Mm -hmm. With a different extents of vertical pleiotropy, horizontal pleiotropy. So to me, there's not per se a reason to expect um, the same thing across the whole genome per se. Yeah, which could be one particular way this plays out. One particular way could just be like everything you see, it just inflates with 20% or it deflates with 20%. Or it could be at certain regions, you see the different things going on. Especially if you think about the, the three ways that selection could play out, where it could be phenotype-based uh, or phenotype-genotype-based in different directions. Uh, so uh, one idea is, is, for example, if you think about educational attainment, uh, if you have, we, there's a strong correlation between health and educational attainment, right? So if people select on education, but there is a, um, another effect from health towards selection. So then a health related SNP all of a sudden becomes associated with educational attainment, whereas there's not really per se a relation. Um, so yeah, all types of things could go on all across the genome. So it makes it hard to interpret these things. Uh, um, and I definitely don't have like clear answers as in, <laughs> right? What is precisely going on at each locus? Is it possible or not possible that um, the SNPs that reveal themselves with weights are the ones that are are your top hits in your GWAS where your phenotype with, with the weights themselves? Yeah, we tested that, and and that was not per se. No. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, and then to, to get the hang of those Manhattan plots a little bit, also for the 10 traits, um, you want to look sort of, so you want to look at things with a, this Hausman test p-value that is uh, very small, so we have strong uh, evidence that it's uh, sort of genome-wide significant for selection bias. But then you also want to look at interesting SNPs, because sometimes if you look at these, they have a different effect, but they're quite insignificant, both in the GWAS and the way to GWAS then I don't really know what we have actually found. But then there were some SNPs that had a very small weighted GWAS p-value that also had a different effect size as estimated by the weighted GWAS compared to the GWAS. And then it happened to be that in GWAS, those were all highly insignificant. So now I'm going to zoom in, zoom in on SNPs that have these two conditions. And I find three new independent loci for type 1 diabetes, right? You see them here already fairly clearly. Uh, and here you can see, see in, in GWAS, they had, they had quite low p-values. Um, but in weighted GWAS, they have, very, quite, they have significant p-values. As a result, this p-value of the Hausman test is strongly significant. And if you look at the effect size also, uh, like for this SNP, it's, it's basically, it's multiplied by five. So it's five times as predictive for type 1 diabetes. Uh, so those are new loci. And for breast cancer, we find one. Uh, where something similar is going on. So completely or completely not, not insignificant at any type of significance threshold that we typically think of as significant, but nonetheless uh, significant once you wait. So you're starting to pick up this thing. Yeah, so one thing that, that we did was um, to go to your question, like what is exactly going on? So we can, of course, zoom into the Manhattan plots and see if there has been associations uh, with other traits that have previously been reported. Uh, and you see some of that stuff going on, but but it's not it's not like fairly significant or anything. So I would call these fairly new signals that we're seeing that haven't really popped up in the literature previously. For the other um, traits, we didn't find stuff like this. Um, if you look at some of the QQ plots, um, it seems like the Hausman test is also a little underpowered to do this stuff. But the test that I have. <laughs> then we can do it heritability estimates. Oh, you can do LD score regression on GWAS, you can do it on weighted GWAS, and then you can 
see if there's a significant difference. And for most traits, we found, again, consistent with the idea that the effect size that becomes stronger, for most traits, we found, indeed, that the heritability estimates uh, increased quite substantially. Well, for example, for age at first birth, heritability of 16.6% uh, increases to 21.3%. Uh, most of the traits have, it's always higher, and it's, it's usually significant, except for uh, BMI, height, and physical activity. I, th I think, for example, height to me really makes sense because I wouldn't expect it too much to, to relate to, to selection per se. There's a hand raised online. Yeah. I think that you know, because for the reason that you are affecting other traits, yeah. so therefore, as a, as a result, the availability estimate will also be increased simply because you're. Right. So we keep plugging the effective sample. I assume that's what. You're yeah, the idea of LD score regression is you can you can estimate heritability irrespective of sample size. Okay. I see. Um, so to, let's say you do a GWAS on hundred thousand people or a million people. Of course, in the million people, you get much more signal. So it, it kind of corrects for that, right? Because it uses the expected distribution of that statistic. So, um, but indeed, we we plugged in the effective sample size and. To be fair, it's a little, it's a little cling, clunky in this sense because we don't per se know if the effective sample size is a good enough way to, to, to make LD score regression, like to keep all the assumptions that it has, you know, to keep them in. But it's, it's something similar to doing, like, for example, the within family GWAS to do uh, within family heritabilities versus population based heritability. So, this, this is sort of the same idea. I do wonder how you calculate sample size for binary tree. When you're running linear, then. same formula, <laughs> but it's a total number of individuals, right? I'm not talking about yeah. effective sample size, just raw G ones. That's a total number of individuals. Yeah, but that that's not that's going to impact the scale of the right? Yes, but so so this is what we would call um um so, so you have different for for binary traces different ways of defining heritability, right? Um, you have the um, there's one type of heritability where you have to put in the population preferences and uh, what's the heritability called again? Liability. Liability scale, heritability. I don't do that here. Um, and, and so I'm actually not making a claim like, oh, the true heritability of breast cancer is like 2% or 1%. I just wanted to compare like with like. So I do the simple, link, the simple additive scale. So I treat it as a continuous trade in that sense, like all the other trades. So this number itself really has not much of an interpretation, but the idea is to compare like with like here. So we can see if it increased compared to this estimate. And of course you can think of all types of transformations to, for example, the liability scale. Um, but those are, I think that those should be monotonous in the additive heritability anyway. So, so that, that increase will still hold, right? That, that sounds fair, but can you just put your mind us what's your equation to calculate the effect of sample factor? Yes. I also see a question in the chat. I'll get to that in a second. This is the equation. No, this is not the equation. This is the equation. There's another equation for binary traces flowing around where you put your cases and controls in, right? Uh, I'm not using the equation here. So, so I guess my question is, you can do this for the raw GWAS based on binary traces. The raw GWAS? Yeah, just just the you know, GWAS on breast cancer without waiting. Yeah, I did it as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's I always plug in the estimates that you see. I want to make things as comparable as possible okay. between GWAS and weighted GWAS. So I always plug in uh, for the regular GWAS. I plug in these, which, as you can see, for the binary one, it's it's actually it really Pretty approximates. Similar. So so we don't it really approximates the true sample size. So we don't. Account here for the what you would sometimes do in GWAS work for the disbalancing cases and controls here. Um, but that's more a measure of to scale certain things that you have anyway. So I'm not too much interested in that. Um, see what's going on in the chat. There is a hand raised online. I tried to say something, but it doesn't seem like you can hear me. Ah, that's oh, yeah, this we, is off. So there it is. Yeah. Okay, we should hear you now. I think. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, um, thank you very much for your present uh, for your presentation. And I have used your weights. So yeah, thank you very much for that too. Yeah. But for this um health outcomes, uh yeah, I think your results are, are very surprising. But I well kind of curious about uh your 
your your your confidence in adjusting for the bias bias for the participant for the participation bias related to health behavior because your weights, as you said, does not involve many health variables because they are not available in sen in sensors, right? So I'm wondering, because there are two kind of influential papers on UK Bell Bank uh, uh, sampling bias. They compare, I think, England Health Survey, Scotland Health Survey with the UKB so that they can compare the association between the education and health outcomes explicitly and see how this uh, survey data, how the estimated say, hazard ratios in the survey data and the UK Bell Bank are uh, Converge or diverge, and that gives a confidence or a sense about how the weights can account for the participation bias related to explicitly involving health at the determinants of of a survey per, per, per participation. So I think uh, for I think for for uh, for your for your approach, I think it would be very helpful if you can compare some estimated coefficient between education or health behavior in, uh, in UK Bell Bank with, with your weights and compare that estimates with uh, the, health, uh, the health survey of England and Scotland. I think that will, I think that at least that will gives me a, a, a very good sense of whether your weights can really adjust for the participation bias related to health behavior. I think that would okay. give me a lot of sense. Yeah, so, so if I understand the question correctly, it's of course the weights they don't capture all the variables, yeah. uh, right? It would be crazy. Um, so if I understand correctly, like like to, that there should be sort of multiple association tests to to check whether the weights work, right? Yes. Yeah. Or probably because you are you have been comparing the the bivariate cor correlations in your K Bell Bank mm -hmm. versus the correlations in census, right? Yeah, so, so what we do in the first paper is we, we do a whole bunch of correlations, but we compare them to the UK census. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so, think how about comparing that also to the Scotland and the England health survey? Yeah, they are, so they so what we could, yeah I agree. What we could do yeah. is there, there, there is some additional testing you could do if you want to have a better sense of the health phenotypes is indeed to, um, yeah. to, to look at the health survey and see if indeed we can uh, yeah. revive some correlations that are yeah, um, sure. From the health yeah. survey. One caveat there I have is though is that the health survey is simply fairly small. So usually what you find um, is that confidence intervals are overlapping. Uh, and, and there's even some literature that we're trying to push back a little bit on in the first paper. There's some literature that combined the UKB to the health survey extensively and said that in the UKB, we actually don't find much evidence for Participate, part, participation bias mattering in the first place. Um, and we're trying to push back on this a little bit because that is simply because if you compare it to the health survey, um, you don't find much evidence for it because your confidence intervals are fairly large. So um, I'm not sure, we can, I can try to do this analysis. I'm not sure how much of a, um, a conclusion it would give in the sense of like, we probably will find that we won't we'll be able to see whether we actually got closer to the truth because the truth in itself is so noisy in the health survey. But I can give it a try. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let's see where I was. I think we've got mostly everything covered by now. So I've large heritabilities. And then one thing, this is very rough, but I think it shows that what we're doing is not completely crazy. Um, uh, you can, of course, put GWAS in a simple FUMA pipeline and you get beautiful graphs. And, and one thing you get is the gene tissue expression analysis. The GWAS that we found, where are those genes expressed? Right? Uh, for education, you want it to be expressed in the brain and not in your foot, because if they're in your foot, then probably you did a bit of a dumb analysis. Right? So in, in, for breast cancer, the GWAS, we found no particular enrichment in any area. So if, if you were to know nothing about breast cancer, you'd be like, oh, where does breast cancer occur? I have no clue, right? Um, when we did the way that you ask, like I say, we get some uh, extra signal in certain low size, some of it is significant, some of it is just there. Uh, maybe some stuff gets suppressed that was noisy. I don't know, but we find that now we found uh, some enriched uh, loci on a genome-wide significant threshold. And this enriched 
uh, these enriched areas are in places where I think they would make sense for breast cancer, namely fallopian tube, uterus, ovary, and breast memory tissue. I don't know much about breast cancer, but <laughs> I think it's not in the brain. <laughs> you know, so that's uh, that's where we found sort of a clear. Um, so I didn't do any like formal p-value testing or something, but I'm just trying to show like basing an analysis on on the one method, which is going to give you maybe some patterns that are more sensible, that are a bit stronger to to draw your co full conclusion of your GWAS analysis compared to this. Uh, I have I have some more on this in supplementary if if uh, if if you guys are interested. But this was the the, the, the one where you found the clearest uh, example of it mattering. Uh, there quickly some robustness checks for for breast cancer. I did a stupid thing of, of combining males and females. It's a bit weird. Uh, we can do the female only sample. So it is all exactly the same. I mean, because the signal you get from males is basically zero anyway. So uh, uh, we get the same, but the effect sizes are multiplied by two, I think. And then um, uh, one thing we can also do if you worry a little bit about how good are these ways of capturing this thing. Uh, well, first of all, in the first paper, I do a lot also of robustness checks and in this paper, especially for this new low side that I found, I was interested in knowing which types of variables are exactly um, capturing that particular part of selection because I put 10 variables in, for example, with breast cancer, it was kind of surprising result. Like, is it self-rated health or is it uh, employment status, for example? So one thing you could do is estimate weights again, but based on fewer variables. And the exercise is something like, which specification do you need? To, to get to, to that same result. So what you see here is the unweighted effect size, the weighted effect size using all the variables that I just showed. So like you see, it gets much stronger. Uh, and then say, okay, what if I do a weight on only one variable? Will I already get towards that newly weighted result? And I don't really get there. Um, but if I do an interaction simply between educational attainment and region, then for breast cancer, I find more or less the same way with estimate. So whatever the selection mechanism is, it can be captured by simply those two variables. Another thing what this analysis shows, I think, is that uh, the more variables we get in the weights, sort of the closer we get to the true thing, but it's not like it goes all over the place. And that's sort of good to know. So, so if you enter these weights in the analysis, it's sort of worst case scenario, you don't capture the selection bias. And best case scenario, you sort of get stably towards a new point. It's not like like if this if this thing would be very sensitive to taking one variable out and all of a sudden it would become positive or something, then weighting is maybe a bit of a scary thing to do. But it's sort of like, yeah, worst case scenario, it doesn't do anything. Uh, best case scenario, you're a bit closer to the truth. Of course, you never know, right? It can do nothing. If you don't capture enough variables in your selection equation, of course, the weights are just gonna tell you that, that there was nothing going on. And this first estimate was correct in the first place. But there's never a guarantee that if you do weighting, you're actually towards the, the true representative estimate in that sense. Uh, and it's also going to depend a lot on the problem and the specific model. Um, but yeah, this, this whole idea is very much the something is better than nothing uh, philosophy that I'm having here. And I saw the intervals would be a lot bigger when you wait. Oh, yeah. Uh, Wait, I'm trying to find a plot again. <laughs> no, back. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're not, right? They're, they're a little bigger, for sure. A little bigger. <clears throat> As you know, that you mentioned, they do look very similar. Maybe I made a mistake in this plot and I <laughs> took uh, the same interval over again. I'll double check. Yeah, you're right. There's this, uh, these fairly homogeneous intervals in that sense. Yeah. I mean, they, they are. They are a little bigger here, right? So um, I do think they are a bit bigger. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the effective sample size, like we still have an effective sample size of uh, 130,000 or something in this analysis. So I say your sample size decreases with 60%. That's finding. That doesn't mean you're all of a sudden completely underpowered, right? I mean, yeah, but if you reduce 50% of your sample size, the interval should inflate by root of two, right? So that, that should be observable. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have a closer look at that. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely see it in the standard errors of the summary statistics that I showed, I think. If we, uh, if we go to the... The effective sample size doesn't, isn't cut across that, is it? Once you wait, yeah. it's not that it's... 
you get the same effect as sample size on every weight. That's not is that that's not true. Yeah, the the, the, the effect of sample size is it's not constant across SNPs. That's true. Sorry. Yeah. The thing you just showed was across weights based on different X's. Yeah, there's also not constant across those. That's right. Um, yeah. Anyway, to sort of wrap up, uh, what we've shown is that um, won't there be a bias in GWAS results? Uh, uh, if you don't correct for it, you might miss some genome wide significant low size. And uh, in general, you might have attenuated effect sizes, could result in some missing heritability. Uh, and you could get potentially biased gene tissue expression findings. And of course, there might be a whole range of post GWAS results that, that might be affected that we're not testing yet. Um, it's also a bit volunteer, uh, it's also a bit phenotype specific to what extent you should care about these things. So I think the largest difference is overall we saw where for the, the health phenotypes, also educational attainment, drinks per week, uh, not so much on the anthropomorphic things like height, BMI, that seemed to be fine. I think BMI, we might have maybe expected a bit more, but we didn't see much. Um, of course, then the big discussion is uh, <laughs> what do we need to do overall in the field? And I think uh, well, in other data cohorts, we are likely to find similar volunteer bias. So those need to be corrected in the same ways. So I think GWAS consortia should really think about trying to get selection ways as part of their um, part of their tool set in all their consortia that they think about. That's going to be quite some work, of course, because selection is always specific for each data set. Um, yeah, and maybe a discussion should be had on representative sampling versus volunteer-based sampling. And this is fairly difficult to solve this issue, right? Because uh, uh, we can now show that if you do volunteer-based sampling, your sample size is not as large as you think it is. It's gonna be a decrease in the effect of sample size. Nonetheless, maybe that's the price you wanna pay if volunteer-based sampling is simply so much easier than getting to representative sampling. So I think it's really a, a cost-benefit type of thing. And it also depends on, you know, uh, you can do at least volunteer-based sampling better, right? You can include more variables to estimate weights better and stuff like that. To what extent do you believe in such a framework, volunteer-based sampling plus weights and correction for sample size or representative sampling, which is maybe more expensive, but everything you do is correct and you don't have to worry about all this stuff. So that's maybe a, sort of a more meta discussion to be had. So that's it. And I uh, don't want to take too much time off Pauline's uh, thing as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so, uh, hi. I hope you still have a bit of brain space for my talk. It could be fairly easier. So, is it a okay. so I'm uh, Pauline, so I'm currently a PhD student at the Clay University in Amsterdam. I'm almost finished with the PhD thesis, so I'm going to present you like a Kind of general story of it and then go in depth into my last paper um yeah so during my phd i was interested in international transmission of mental health and education so there are many studies from many different uh, scientific fields that report that parents who have higher diploma also tend to have children who have uh, go have a longer education uh, and then that parents who have mental disorder tend to have children who go on and developing themselves mental disorder and additionally, these two groups are the same group of people. So person who have longer, uh, lower number of years of education, they also tend to have more mental disorder. Um, however, nowadays, the studies, um, most studies still report correlations. So we don't really know um, how education and mental health are truly linked. Is, is it causal relationship between education and mental health? And all these are transmitted so is it really the education and the mental health of parents that matters or are these association created by shared genetics or by shared environmental factors? So if we want to improve education or mental health, we need to have a better understanding of uh, if these arrows are representing uh, true causal effects. So the idea of my thesis is uh, or was <laughs> to use genetic as a tool to help, um, to help us in, um, understand and investigate the causal relationship between all these variables. So we used uh, molecular genetic methods, but also pedigree methods based on family data, uh, and also a combination of both. So when possible, I also try to combine different methods to triangulate and like use methods that have different set of assumptions to try to see 
um, yeah, strengthen all conclusions, basically. So just in, in one sentence, the I mentioned a few pathways I, I looked um, earlier in my thesis. So in the first paper, with a last large collaboration, I look at which gene and variants were associated with cognitive and non-cognitive uh, aspect of education. And then in the second paper, I used this data and combined this information with family data to try to, well, I look at indirect genetic effect, if you're familiar with this, and basically showed that there is indeed environmental effect of parental cognitive and non-cognitive skills on their children's education. And then the third paper, uh, I looked at the effect of education attainment on mental, um, or like on the risk of being diagnosed with a mental disorder. So I used one, one sibling design in the Dutch population registry and also Mendelian randomization. So then using molecular genetics. Um, as overall, um, I do find a causal effect of education attainment on mental health for most disorders, except few disorders, for example, bipolar disorder, where both methods actually show totally opposite uh, effects. So it's kind of interesting and also shows that it's important to triangulate on methods. So I just prepared this paper Monday. <laughs> so if you read it, uh, please let me know if you have any feedback, any comments. I'll be very happy to hear your opinion. Um, so that was like the, the few papers that are all already done. And now I, I want to, to show you the paper I'm still trying to finish, which is uh, investigating the effect of parental mental health on their children's education. Um, so here we looked at school performance of children. So as I mentioned earlier, estimating this effect is not straightforward because of confounding factors that exist. So things like the neighborhood, the social economic status and genetics. Um, so one possibility to get a better causal estimate is to control for each of these confounding factors which means you need to identify all of them and measure all of them and then control for them, which is basically impossible. Another possibility is experiments, but of course in this setting, it's not something uh, that is possible to do and natural experiments are not so common either. So one way to strengthen our analysis compared to observational um, traditional analysis is to use designs that aim at controlling for unmeasured factors. And in this project, I use an extension of the sibling design. So the sibling design is a method that uh, allows for controlling for unmeasured uh, factors by comparing siblings. Siblings are matched on a lot of variables that share, they share the same familial environment, the same um, yeah, childhood environment and 50% of their genome um, and so on. So if we compare the outcomes of siblings that allow us to keep these familial shared factors constant without having to measure any of them. So in this project, we adapted this method and use it in, in the intergenerational setting. Um, so we compare the mental health of siblings in the parental generation and then compare the outcome of the children. Um, so here we ask, is the sibling with worth mental health more likely to have a child who has lower school performance? By comparing the parents that are sibling, we control for the, the factors that are shared by these parents. So to test this statistically, we use between sibling, uh, between within sibling regression. So we estimate the between sibling effect by regressing the average mental health uh, score of the parents, so the siblings. And then we estimate the within sibling effect by regressing out the difference between the parent individual score with the sibling average. Uh, so this within sibling effect is representing the effect of the, sorry, <laughs> I'm in front. <laughs> I'll do that. Um, yeah, so it's representing the effect of the parent uh, mental health when you control for these family factors. So this estimate is a bit closer to a causal estimate than you would. Just a yeah. clarification yeah, sure. question. Yeah. What is the mental score? Oh, yeah, I'm going to go there, but it's like basically self-report mental health um, from several like a survey. Questions. Several questions, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, standard covariate and random effect of the family. Um, yeah, so for this analysis, I use MOBA data, which is a longitudinal study in uh, Norway. And we link this data. So this MOBA data contains a lot of survey that are sent to parents and uh, to children when these are old enough to, to fill in. There's a lot of personality question, mental health, um, uh, some health measures, and so on. Um, 
Yeah, and then we can link to the Norwegian registry data and that gets all the information on pedigree, on education from the entire uh, Norwegian population. So I uh, first get the sample of children of siblings. I identified the, the siblings uh, from the registry data and then identify individuals whose parents are siblings. So they share the same grandparents, either from their mother's or their father's side, and then link this data to the mobile cohort. Um, so there I only included, or like I excluded all family for which one of the sibling didn't have uh, answered, was not part of mobile, or the, the children were not part of mobile. So I only included complete family and also only included one child per parent. So in total, depending on the mental health measure, the sample was between 2,000 to 20,000 and then grouped into families up to 9,800 families. I cannot say any numbers in English, it's terrible. Um, you need MOBA because MOBA has the mental health measures and not the registry. Exactly. And- you need um, the registry because, I mean, you, can, you can't use genetic data to do the pedigrees. Sorry? You couldn't actually do the use the genetic data of the mothers to form the pedigrees? Mm, the, um, not everyone has genetic data in mobile yet. Okay. So that was allowing to like get siblings and things like this. Yeah, yeah so for uh, child school performance, uh, I used the result of the national test course in mathematics, reading comprehension and... So what are you saying? Uh, I think it's the Zoom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Zoom, Zoom crashed. crashed. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was saying national test scores that are given when they are in fifth grade, so it's when they are in about 10 years old. Um, so we use this data at 10 years old because it's before the onset of most like pathology, but also for practical reason that this is most like the time where most children, um, we have data for most children in mobile. So now I think in mobile, the children are about 16 years old. Yeah, and then I standardized the score within each test and each year of the entire population. Um, for parental mental health, so here you self-report scales that are collected by MOBA, and then I standardized them with my sample. Um, so yeah, these are participants that are not selected based on mental health. So this kind of like is um, normal range of symptoms that you would see in a kind of representative population. and. Yeah, the, so uh, I'm used to give this talk to psychologists, so they are aware, like they know what are all these scores, but basically I looked at anxiety and depression, and this is like short measure, sub, short version of the Opskin symptoms checklist, which is like, have you been feeling sad to, to be in the last two weeks and so on? So several scores like this. Then ADHD is another self-report, alcohol problematic use, eating disorder, um, which are like questions about the importance of weight for self-image, uh, binging and dieting and behavior and so on. And um, yeah, and I also, for what I'm going to present, I'm, com I'm using both m mother and father. So I try to use mental, like measures that were comparable for the two. And then when possible, finding measures that were done during pregnancy or the closest in time to when the child are giving, are taking the test. So I'm going to show you the results now. And uh, first I'm gonna show you the result for what um, yeah, we call observational association, which is the, the estimates from a simple regression with like, the standard covariance. So basically what you would um, see in most studies and, and there I also do it in the full total, like full MOBA sample. So without excluding anyone who doesn't have a sibling. And then I'll compare it with a uh, sample, the same simple regression in the children of siblings sample, uh, which has a lower sample size. And that was like to get an idea of how weird this subsample was. And then the within sibling estimates, so which is like the quasi causal association. The first one has a random effect at the family level. That's what the UJ is. It's yeah. Like yeah, in the, in the women's uh, family design as well. Um, yeah, so for observ observational association in a total MOBA sample, 
Uh, as you can see for math and reading, there's um, most of the time negative association, which is what you would expect. So uh, if your parents have low, higher symptoms for mental health disorder, you, the children also have lower um, score in school in their tests. Um, so that's the case, except for problematic alcohol use. And then for English, the pattern is a bit weird because, oh, I see we don't really see the zero on the screen. Yeah, that's not the best. <laughs> so here, if you see the zero is there, so these are actually positively associated. So parents that have higher symptoms of anxiety, depression, have children who are better in English in this observation. Of like the measurement is the, the language of these. Yeah, so they have three three scores, um, three tests, and it's math, reading in Norwegian, which is common like uh, their language, yep. and then English as a foreign language. So Norwegian is there also like a, a, a an outcome for Norwegian? Yeah, the reading is in Norwegian. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So English is a bit odd there, uh, but with. Eating pregnancy, uh, eating disorder in pregnancy at age eight, this is negative again. Um, so what you would expect. So the the red stars there are showing um, significance when I control for multiple testing. So most of these are significant, but you can still see that the effects are quite small. So the betas are maximum zero point zero five. Then looking at the same association in um, the subsample, so children of sibling subsample, they are basically the same. I mean, as we would expect, the standard they are a bit bigger because the sample size is lower. There's no strong difference, but now some of the effects are not significant anymore already. And for ADHD, it feels like maybe this is one of the symptoms where, where there, there is more of a bias. Um, so we don't see the zero there, but this is like really zero and this is significantly negative. So in our children of siblings subsample, there might be already some kind of bias or for ADHD, that might not be really representative of the population. Then finally, the women's sibling association. So here there's no red star appearing, so nothing is significant anymore. Um, so once we control for family shared factors, there's actually no association between the mental disorder symptoms of the parents and the child test scores. We do have some suggestive association, which is really hard to see now that there's no zero line, but for basically eating disorder at eight, eight um, the, this is 95% uh, confidence, confidence interval without controlling for multiple testing, they are, yeah. Are these continuous symptoms or like a yes, no, high level? Uh, yeah, they are all continuous. Yeah. Or like, there's like between five and seven items, basically. So between zero. Continuous and psychological sense, like, yeah. Um, yeah, so pregnant, eating, pregnant, eating disorder in pregnancy and age eight and um, depression at age eight. Is kind of suggestive effect, but this is not significant. Um, and for all the others, there's no even like no suggestive effect. Um, one thing that might be interesting if we look at the suggestive effect is that this is um, the effect in pregnancy seem to be really lower when we look at age eight. They don't really change, so it might be an indication that during symptoms at later age or closer to the test of the children are more important. Yes. So to sum up this result, it, we don't really find uh, an effect on parental mental health on children's school performance. There might be some suggestive within sibling effects, so potential causal effect. But even if we do look uh, in a bigger sample and suddenly these effects are significant, probably the effect size don't change and then the effect size is quite small. Um, we had pre-registered that we would run a model where we control for parental education. So we did this as well. And in this case, there's no suggestive effect uh, anymore. Uh, yeah, do I have time? Yeah, not so much. Uh, so I'll just go quickly over this. Um, my plan is to triangulate with another method that looks at indirect genetic effects. 
So genetic effects of parents that are have to go through the environment. And the idea was if there is an indirect genetic effect, then are they mediated by parental mental health? And with preliminary results, uh, there is actually no indirect genetic effect for this measure at age 10. So nothing for the parent mental health to mediate. Um, so there's two big caveats with these studies in, in MOBA is that we are looking at the population range of symptoms. So maybe if we would look at diagnosis of and like severity or like, yeah, more <laughs> symptoms that are more severe than the effect of pain disorder would be bigger. And then the second point to keep in mind is MOBA sample is not really representative of the Norwegian population. So these are so I standardized the, the test score of the children in the entire population, and this is the, the mean I get in mobile. So you can see that the children have That's kind of crazy. Why is it? I guess it's partly like so you're first talking about non-representative yeah. samples. I can't imagine the UK Biobank would be this bad. Um, I'm not sure. I would think UK Biobank is quite bad as well. On you know, education. I don't think they say their cognitive say their cognitive scores versus the population. You think that they're like. 0.25 standard deviations better on cognitive scores than the general. And you can buy a man? I, I don't wonder. know what you think. That's like, this is, um, well, my question was really yeah. like, why is MOBA so crazy? crazy? No, you could be as crazy. Okay. Yeah. This is, um, there's not very lots of standardized measures that I have in mind, but uh, for example, for educational attainment, we're giving a, a difference of almost a year, which I think is. That's a quarter standard deviation, right? And uh, you definitely don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And for the Townsend Index, for example, we also we actually find precisely a quarter standard deviation. So, uh, so okay, now you maybe that's a new rule. Maybe, of okay, you convinced me they're equally bad. Why is yeah. MOBA bad? Like, yeah, I, I understand. I think it's a bit similar system of uh, including people in part in the in the data. So they were basically recruiting women during pregnancy by going to the hospitals. But did they get a five percent? Response rate is that the? <laughs> I don't know actually. I don't remember. Um, yeah, I'll check what is the response rate. It's also like no, it's age ten, so the attrition is already quite big compared to like pregnancy and uh, yeah. And I think what so oh no, actually there's no difference. I was gonna say something wrong, but like if I look in the the children of siblings sub sample, it's even worse. Like this is the total MOBA sample and the children of siblings, which is you need to have two parents or like me and my sister, we both go in mobile and we both put our kids and our, our husbands and so that you would expect even more bias there. This is where you could do something with UK Biobank if you have siblings in there also, you could ask this question of the both siblings, right, because you have genetic siblings and that you can capture in Biobank. Um, I didn't want to, are you, are you Mostly done, or do you have yeah. to? I, I want to ask. The only thing there. is, yeah, I was hinting at this paper that is uh, not published yet. But um, when I was in Oslo, then I realized one colleague from the Norwegian population, um, what is it called? The Public Health Institute, um, Magnus Normo, is actually working on a very similar topic, except it's kind of like um, solving the two caveats I have because he's using depression and anxiety diagnosed from the Norwegian population uh, registry. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the entire data, the entire Norwegian uh, population and kind of more severe because you have to be treated for this. Um, he did look at age 16 instead of age 10 and he compared siblings instead of children of siblings. But overall, the, idea, the conclusion is quite similar. So he did find an, a small effect of, I don't know. So if you're comparing yeah. siblings, who's the depression then? Yeah, so that's like time of the diagnosis of the parents and then comparing siblings from like your mother was only diagnosed after I got the test. So the second the second sibling. Thanks. Yeah, it's all a bit uh, so it's it's different. It's a like, different question, but you could do mm -hmm. something more about it. You have a scale. You could make a diagnosable part of the scale. You're yeah. all continuous, right? Yeah. I, I'm not sure I would get that many, because of the bias, actually, I'm not sure yeah. I would get that many severe they, yeah. uh, patients. So what does this estimate tell me then? It's like, if I am part of a sibling pair, and it just happened to be that uh, my mother got diagnosed with depression because I'm the younger person, Yeah. Uh, and I guess you can control for the birth order and stuff like that, then it's just like, 
if I happen to the, the timing, then then I have like a, a bit of a lower test score. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But only only if your parents got diagnosed within three years of you getting the tested. If it's like more than three years, uh, so they get the test at sixteen. There's no no effect anymore. So it's kind of the same story of like the effect is small and maybe just it's small. You can't tell the difference between those, right? It's just like, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm curious to see uh, where he's going with this paper. Um, it doesn't compete with yours, I don't think. I think you're no, it's a questions. kind of nice, uh, yeah, yeah. different set of uh, data. Yeah, yeah. So that's the conclusion. That can I, I can I say something? Oh, yeah. James first. Yeah. Can I uh, <laughs> ask about your your study about the association between parental what was it mental health and offspring test scores? So yeah. why why did you or did you also count for children's mental health? No, didn't. So MOBA has tons of CPCL data. You could easily yeah. go vary out those effects because could that also be explaining why their their test scores might be uh, skewed in one or the other direction? So if parents are also if if parental uh, let's say depression mm. right is heritable, mm. then, and the child is also in some ways likely to have inherited some of those genes for depression too, right? Yeah. which could then influence their test scores as, yeah. as a bit of a mechanism. So I'm wondering if you had accounted for like concurrent mental health with the child. I think that would have been my follow-up question if there were the, was an effect here, but there is no effect. We don't find any effect or association between parent mental health and could children's performance. you go back to your, your main result, that, that yeah. last slide that had all of the... This one. But that kind of... Uh, the between um, family um, slope, right? It would not be yeah. in your within family, within social caps. So if you have a significant between, um, between no, it, but it would be in the, the within, except if both children have. But genetic nurture is shared between the siblings. We're confusing, I think, yeah. who the siblings are here. These are the parents, the parents. right? Yeah. So you're talking about like niece, nephew nurture or something now, right? It's a little confusing because the yeah, sister yeah. too, you know. Yeah. But one thing um, I wanted to say about bottom left back, and you kind of said this in your interpretation, but if you asked what effects can you rule out with your um, green dot, yeah, you can't say anything. You 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 might be confident that the effects are not more than 0.1 standard deviation. Mm. That's about all you can say, right? For these things, you mean? Yeah, or... where your hand is, the green, yes. You could interpret that as a zero. Yeah. Or. or... Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that kind of goes to what you say at the end of whether there's effect, there's like anything there. Yeah. Or not, yeah. Because right? it... you're kind of underpowered here, it would seem. I do think we are underpowered. Um, yeah, I agree. That's why I think the conclusion is like there might be some, it looks like the. Even if they are some, they are not that strong. You're not that strong. I don't know how to think about point one. If that's, I think you're thinking uh, yeah. that's not very big regardless. Is that right? Well, it's an R square of like zero point two, uh -huh. which is, I think, not that strong. Uh, this is just but, a disciplinary difference. Yeah. About, um, about R square. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's a good point. And I could have like comparison to show that it's not that. Big. But James's point, you could have exactly this where all the outcomes were children's mental health yeah. measures. Has that already been done with, with your design? Um, not with its design. There's some other studies doing more like structural equation modeling children of twin design that look at, at one with ADHD and they also only find genetic effect. So they don't find an effect of the symptoms of the parents on the child ADHD. They only find that the Shared genetic is explaining the association between parents and children. So that's also in mobile. For the others, I'm pretty sure there's something in like internalizing, so depression and anxiety, but I don't remember. Uh, yeah. Did you also um, add these three scores? If, if you're a little underpowered, maybe you can say something about the totality of. Yeah, um, that's actually the same sample size, right? So that would not change the sample size. No, but. Like take a principal component or just simply an aggregate score out of these three modules uh, to uh, to have sort of complete schooling attainment say and then you have yeah. you've, you've reduced your measure, measurement error basically 
Just maybe. Well, maybe the outside for like, English, yeah. which is a bit odd. Yeah, yeah measuring yeah. error mental health. And a, oh, yeah, that's true. That would also be the outcome. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I was oh, actually thinking that you could mention reduction on the mental health side. Because yeah. you, you're you already mentioned that as a caveat, like some of these disorders have extremely low base rates, mm -hmm. right? Like the eating mm -hmm. disorder symptomatology, yeah, that, relative yeah. to anxiety and depression, which is yeah. definitely skewed in a different direction. Yeah, and I think so. I standardized to try to get like beta that are similar, but actually, in eating disorder, we did the uh, item response theory to try I to get that, like yeah. a bit better, yeah, phenotyping, let's say, compared to the others, but. That's also where I'm a bit afraid, actually, that maybe like eating disorder is the one where we get some nice effects. But it's also where we do the IRT, maybe. I'm curious if we would do uh, item response model for these two, if we would see a bit different patterns. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. So with the exception of eating disorder, they, yeah. they don't seem to be that skewed away from the observational you know, uh, estimate in the sense of yeah, did that kind of outside of bit, like maybe the bias wasn't more severe there. Um, or, or do you think you're just too underpowered to say much about that? But it seems like the observation. Yeah, I think it's not quite different. underpowered to really say if there's a difference or not. And then the original effect. I think I was surprised that the original effect was so close to zero all the time. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, there, there is, yeah, outside of this one, and um, a bit similar in pregnancy, that was the only thing that looks like there is a, indeed a reduction of effect size. But, so, take eating yeah. disorder. So you have those, those are two measures at two different points in time indexed by the child's age. That, yeah, right? exactly. And, but you have many more measures, or is this just like you have two maximum? And, you, and these There's are the more measures. Are so we could like do another design where we look at like aggregate all the measures for the mother and have kind of a lifetime yep. eating disorder of the mother that would be possible also possible for example to look at for mothers that have several children in MOBA mm -hmm. to look at different time point um so like yeah doing the aggregation where it's more like an ever measure onto the kids test scores at whatever the ages mm -hmm. are, are, it seemed like they would set you up to get the the most the biggest coefficient to start with like these mm -hmm. coefficients are to me subsequent tables where you ask like not only does eating disorder matter but when does it even, yeah like you're you're you you already skipped to the when yeah right without um without capturing the full profile of ever eating disorder say ever for were. the child yeah that's a good point oh yeah are these all biased um yes okay. yeah so from the population registry, you don't know because it's legal representative, basically legal parents. Uh, but I think in mobile, we, yes, we do have, because it, they are recorded at least for the mother's side, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, for the father's side, eating disorder is only mothers, but the others are both. We, I did the analysis splitting like same sex siblings. So like only mothers compared to theirs, or like to the aunt and, and the patterns are basically the same. Um, how old were they when they did the testing? Um, 10. Is your testing at a later age? I wonder if like you're too early for some of these symptoms. Or if it's too short. Through childhood symptoms, like, yeah. like, so more for, like these, the, are the, these are the mother's symptoms. No, but I, I understand that. But if it operates through the child symptoms, like alcohol use is going to start by this point. Yeah. Eating disorder symptoms probably will start by this point. Fresh pain symptoms tend to occur like later. Like, yeah. Eight years. So. That was. I mean, in a way, that was the idea to get like age 10 because it's before the children's symptoms. So to see if there's really an effect of the parents, um, like the paper from Magnus that is there, they look at age 16. In mobile, I think maybe next year we can have age 16, but not the kids were still too small. Um, so yeah, in the population registry, you can do this and that's what they looked. So maybe, I'm curious if he's going to plan to, to look at other type of dinos and not only depression anxiety. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank That's you. my call. <laughs>